Okay. Hello, everyone, and uh, may the fourth be with you. Um, today, we're going to be covering period three, which is the revolutionary era of uh, America. Um, now, to begin, let's kind of go over the agenda of kind of what we're going to be covering today. Uh, the first part will be covering the context. The second part is the uh, lead up to the revolution, as well as the revolution and the independence itself. Then we'll be covering uh, federalism uh, in the form of the Articles of Confederation and the Constitution, as well as we'll be ending with the first party system. Uh, so let's start it off. So first off, to begin the revolutionary era, we have to talk about the era beforehand, and that's the mercantile era. Uh, this is primarily dominated by British mercantilism, which is a form of zero-sum economics. I would highlight this uh, because this is very important to understanding mercantilism and is a massive reason to why the revolution even happened. Uh, so what British mercantilism is, is the idea that um, th to hold maritime supremacy basically to control the seas and mercantilism is the idea of a you win i lose situation basically a belief that resources and economics are limited so uh as kind of described by this picture here it's a bit blurry but uh, the mother country essentially takes resources and money from the colonies in order to prevent other nations from acquiring it that is what zero-sum economics is uh, it's vastly different from what we have today, uh, and this predominantly uh, ruled over up until the uh, 1800s. So the British believed in maritime supremacy, and they primarily did so in the Columbian Exchange. And what the Columbian Exchange is, is this triangular, well, it's like a kite-shaped exchange between Britain, Africa, uh, America. So essentially the uh, Americas and the Caribbean would send sugar to uh, the 13 colonies and the 13 colonies would send rum and goods and such to Africa and in which case Africa most most of the times uh, slaves would be exported from Africa right thr uh, straight to Americas uh, and this is where Amer uh, Britain tries to play is in now Britain in order to profit from their massive empire at this time imposed tariffs on all of their colonies. And what tariffs are, are taxes that are imposed on the exporter. Now, basically, this means that instead of our regular taxes, where the person buying the product will have to pay extra for the product, the person who's bringing the product in will have to pay the tax. Therefore, they have to raise the goods price in order to compensate for the tax. It makes goods more expensive. But this allows for the mother country to uh, gain its own, uh, gain money out of it. Now, by common sense, British merchants terribly hate these uh, tariffs, especially the Nav Navigation Acts, which are the tariff, which is how the tariffs are being imposed. So instead of going straight through to Britain, which is what you would usually do to legally do this, uh, and legitimately do it is, they would instead go to New World or foreign ports. So basically, instead of heading back to England to drop off their goods or sell them off because it's more expensive due to the tariffs, uh, they would instead go to, say, Spanish Florida or at this point, uh, French Canada, and they would drop off the goods and the goods will make its way through land instead of the naval tariffs that exist. Uh, however, this actually made the British lose significant revenue because of the tariffs imposed, which ultimately led to a British depression, kind of an economic stagnation, which made them reinforce the tariffs, and it completely creates this new cycle of, you know, avoiding tariffs. So Britain tries to enforce the Navigation Acts to counter this. It essentially, there are three main ideas of the Navigation Acts that you should know. The first is that it forces all British ships to dock in England before trading in any of their colonies. So that means if they're trying to go to Africa, they have to go to England first to get tariffs to drop off any products they have, and then they will bring a certain amount of those products to Africa, 
And then from Africa, if they want to head back to uh, the 13 colonies, they would have to go back to England, kind of like the pig thing is. And there will be Royal Navy ships enforcing this. As you can tell, that's not exactly too, uh, it's not really a fair act, but it is how Britain is uh, keeping their place. Uh, secondly, only British ships could import or export into the colonies. That means that uh, essentially they're preventing Spanish, French, or any other nation from being able to trade directly with the colonies. They have to be, they can only trade via land. So this is to prevent the resource, uh, again, the siphoning of resources from the 13 colonies. And perhaps the most important part is that staple goods and important goods such as tobacco and sugar are only allowed to be traded into Britain. So this is kind of like an add-on to the second part in that all of these important goods cannot, is not allowed to go to any of these countries or to Africa. However, the Atlantic is quite massive, so it makes the act very difficult to enforce. So instead, there's a creation of a smuggling ring uh, whereby most merchants don't want to pay the tariffs and they don't want to uh, pay a fine by the Navigation Act, so they create smuggling rings to go under or to go above and generally uh, avoid the British, uh, British enforcement. And this creates the era, this kind of leads into the era that, we're st that we'll start off with, and that's salutary neglect, which is the colonial prosperity under British maritime protection, basically when the colonies prospered under British naval protection, and it gave the colonies basically autonomy over their taxes and imports because it was very difficult to enforce the navigation acts which dictated all of their taxation and import laws which in turn actually had the counter effect uh, counterintuitive effect of making it worse for uh, Britain to enforce it so up until 1754 from the 1650s to 1754 salutary neglect was the default relations between Britain and the 13 colonies. Now, we start off in 1754 because of a little, well, not little, it's a big war known as the Seven Years' War. Now, if you guys, if you've taken AP Euro, you would know what this war is. It's perhaps the first unofficial world war, uh, and it takes place massively, but we're not going to talk about that. Instead, we're going to focus on the French and Indian War, which particularly took place in the Americas. It's called the French and Indian War uh, because it's part of the Seven Years' War because it was the British fighting against the French and their Indian allies, their Native American allies. Uh, and this is kind of what the war took place in. It generally took place along the borders here. Uh, and this is the new border that was drawn after the British have won. They basically seized Canada. Uh, however, wars are very expensive. And the French and Indian War bankrupted the British. And this, again, led back to the Depression. So the British are forced to violate the Salutary Neglect Agreement that they originally held. So now let's go into the causes of how they violated into the Salutary Neglect. First off, there was this proclamation of 1763. This I would remember. This is semi-important. Uh, in the DBQ, on your test, so remember, the, the test is open book, so I would write down as much notes as you can right now, just so you can refer to them on the test. First off, the Proclamation of 1763. It was a de declaration that basically prevented expansion beyond this Appalachian, the Appalachian Mountains. Uh, and the reasoning behind this was that the British, after the war, managed to build good relations with the uh, Native Americans in this territory, so specifically the Iroquois Confederacy, as well as the Navajo in the Midwest. Uh, and a lot of colonists were kind of angry at this because up until now, salutary neglect also meant that, that they could expand however much they want. And generally their expansion went from this black line that I'm drawing. These are all, this was kind of the land that was claimed uh, during the time of salutary neglect. A lot of land was claimed at this point. It's a bit inaccurate. It's more like here. There we go. That's that's kind of the land. Anyway, um, the second act that also pissed a lot of uh, colonists off was the Currency Act, the 1764 Currency Act. Uh, long story short, 
basically the British in order to stabilize the colonial and their own economics it's very complicated so I'll try and break it down as simply as I can they basically refused to back any state issued currency uh, so basically at this point because of salutary neglect because of salutary neglect each state issued their own currency and they had somewhat of a foreign exchange market in that each state's currency was put against gold, silver, gems, and products, as well as against every other state's currency and the British pound. Uh, but the British, in order to stop these, this kind of like recessive behavior, uh, simply just passed the Currency Act to refuse any future issued uh, soft currency, basically paper money. They would only take gold, silver, or gems. Basically, anything that has intrinsic value, not fiat value, not anything that is um, value whose base is based, based on uh, what people believe it's worth, but something that actually has worth itself. However, this doesn't mean that the states can't issue money, but that people in these states, all of these states, and their state governments can't pay back any debts because no one would take... Uh, soft currency now that the British won't take soft currency to pay off debts so this kind of trickles down uh, this again angers a lot of folks uh, the next part is the quartering act of 1765 now this is there's two quartering acts you have to remember this part as well there's two quartering acts one is part of the intolerable acts which I'll talk about later but this one is the first intolerable act that will later be amended it really isn't that significant this one because it just basically says that if the British ran out of room for their troops they can just they uh, people must allow their troops to stay in their houses but this is only on the condition that there's not enough housing for troops now this part this part you definitely have to write down I am going to highlight this this is called the Townshend Act hold on this is the Townshend Act Townshend, uh, the Townshend Acts are a series of acts that predate the Intolerable Acts. What the Townshend Acts basically stated is that it taxes regular commodities, such as glass, sugar, and tea. Now, this is the equivalent of taxing toilet paper in our current society. These are very, very luxurious, but yet staple products, especially tea. And I'll talk about tea in particular and how impactful it was. They're not tariffs. Remember, tariffs in, uh, tariffs fine the exporter. These are people trying to pay for the product. So ultimately, this hurts the consumers more. They have to pay more for the same amount of products. And this is now on top of the navigation acts that is now being reinforced. Basically, they can't buy it from foreign merchants unless they try to travel. But again, travel at this time was extremely difficult, if not by sea. So basically, they're being extorted in some ways. Now, tea in particular was what really angered the colonists, and this played a significant part in swinging uh, opinions. Tea. Um, tea at that time was the equivalent of what coffee is to American modern American society. It is, and perhaps even more, because tea at this time was used in a variety of functions, mostly custom more marial which means that if you invite someone to your house you would offer them tea or if you go to a ball or something like that you go to any sort of formal or semi-formal or even casual events your the expectation the cultural expectation is to offer tea and a massive tax on the tea means that there's going to be less amount of those products available and ultimately it will damage social events as well basically tea in itself is uh, a standard of how civilized you are uh, to British society and this time being civilized was the massive like the the, the thing that people wanted to go for they wanted to seem uh, they want to seem as if they are very civilized that they're wealthy all that sorts and tea is how they demonstrate it so the imposement of the Townshend Act which includes the Tea Act created two particular things so first off, the Boston Tea Party occurred. So as you can see here, there are some uh, American colonists dressed as Native Americans throwing tea into the Boston Harbor. 
Um, basically a group of, uh, I would say, they're terrorists. By modern definitions, our definition of terrorist differs from terrorist, but by an objective definition, these are terrorists. They're using violent means to acquire a political goal. But basically, they threw hundreds of thousands of pounds of tea into the sea. It's not just two ships. There was, there was at least, there was a lot of ships. And the Sons of Liberty basically snuck onto the ships. They threw the tea into the harbor. And for a few days after, the harbor waters remained green from how much tea was thrown in. Uh, this might seem counterintuitive, but think about it like this. If they're taxing tea and you're throwing them aboard, you're basically making it into a lose-lose situation instead of a one-sided winning situation. Um, and this really swung, like, civilized opinion against uh, British rule. And here we can see a painting that displays the open resentment against British policies. This painting is called The Bostonians Paying the Tax Man. And it's de depicting the tearing, uh, the tarring of John Malcolm, who was the commissioner of imports and customs of Boston at the point. He was a. F this is a famous representation of the growing dissent and hatred of the by the colonists of their British rulers. So then, now because of these two events, the Boston Tea Party, and basically the growing resentment and harassment of British officials. The British Parliament enacted a series of acts known as the Intolerable Acts. This is fundamentally important to understanding why the revolution occurred. This is not a good highlighter. The reasoning behind this is that the Intolerable Acts could in fact be defined as the turning point of uh, the revolution, well, the start of the revolution. At this point, only those who were affected by these acts, particularly the middle and upper class, were really against British rule. Otherwise, everyone else was fairly uh, casual about it. They were not so against British rule. So the first of these is known as the Stamp Act. The Stamp Act, even though it was passed in 1765, many would consider that as part of the Intolerable Acts. And it basically mandates that all documents and I don't just mean like legal documents, but all documents, newspapers, not toilet paper, but newspapers, uh, lawyer documents, writs, petitions, anything that may be submitted to anyone requires anything that's official or legal in idea needs a stamp. And that stamp costs money. And these are the stamps that needs to be considered on there. And basically documents without stamps are supposed to be rejected, though there have been some that kind of just bypass this law. Um, and this, again, a lot of people feel like this is a violation of their acts, and it really much is. Essentially, think about having like having a mandate that states that all of your documents or homework or something like that needs a stamp and you have to pay for it. It's generally uh, very, very isolating. Next, we have the Quartering Act of 1774. Now, this, again, acts upon the previous Quartering Act, and it strickens it. Uh, British colonials, basically colonial citizens, must give residence to any uh, British government personnel when requested. So this doesn't just include soldiers anymore. It includes officers or um, any official government uh, service people who are coming over uh, from the British Isles. They, if they request, just the act of request means that you have to give them residence. And this was a drawing point. The Quartering Act of 1774 was another significant point on how, uh, on where the opinions really turned against British, uh, the British rulers. Next was the Administration of Justice Act. This is not an act that's usually talked about with the Intolerable Acts. Um, but it is an intolerable act, and it is one of the most uh, damaging acts of them all. It basically gives the British royal governor of Massachusetts, uh, or actually of any state, to have kind of extrajudicial power. Extrajudicial is a, is a big word. But basically what that means is that they are allowed to act, they are allowed to act within the law, but acting within the law of acting outside the law. Let me explain that. So basically, they, ha they are allowed to request for any British citizens or colonists 
to any other to change their venue of trial and the reason behind this is that they believe that the trial would be unfair however by changing the venue usually to England or some other very far away region from the co uh, colony it basically means that there is a lack of witnesses uh, usually against the uh, defendant uh, because it's very expensive for people at these times to travel there additionally they lose money just by going there because they, they can't attend to their business or work and this is very infuriating in the context of Boston Massacre and I'll talk more about that later so these are two additional acts that uh, again angered people these are not these two acts are not as significant as these three um, but the Port Act basically closed the Port of Boston until the people of Massachusetts uh, could pay back the damages caused by the Tea Act. Um, many people, f men this actually angered people, a lot of loyalists, people who are loyal to the British regime, because they are being damaged, even though they still support the British regime, they're, they feel like they have been alienated by people they've previously supported. And the next act is the Massachusetts Government Act. Now this act in particular, when combined with the Correspondence Committee, uh, basically angered a lot more folks than anything else. It first off stripped Massachusetts of its state constitution. Now all states are essentially given the ability to pick a constitution and to dictate that as part of solitary neglect. And the Massachusetts constitution was stripped away. Uh, all bureaucratic positions were basically able to be replaced by the royal governor. The royal governor at this time was loyal to the king and the king alone, not even to parliament, but just to the king. The king would appoint a royal governor and usually he would appoint a friend or family of his. It's called nepotism. And basically they ban all t uh, town meetings or any gathering unless the governor approves of it, which effectively bans public dissent, bans like protests like these. It, 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 a lot of Englishmen at this time, remember all people in the colonies, still believe they're Englishmen. They're not independent. They still hold allegiance to the British, uh, to the British monarchy. Uh, it, a lot of folks felt that this was violating the natural rights that they held. Uh, and I'll talk more about that later. Now, you might ask at this point, well, all of this is happening in Massachusetts. Why would other states care because at this point remember i talked about this before all of the states essentially acted like their own country people were more uh people felt like they're more new yorker or virginian than say 13 colonists because the 13 colonies were no more than a uh you know a, a, a title there's nothing more than that they were more loyal to their state than to a unified idea. In fact, as I'll talk about here, they, they, they would laugh at the idea of a unified nation. So there are correspondence committees, which is like a, like a simplified version of a foreign affairs department between each state. Now each state would basically pass letters and uh, publications to one another to warn them of what's happening in their state. Again, remember this was the uh, 1760s. There was communication was very difficult. Most communication was by horse. Um, and one big event that really swung many states' opinions against the British control was the Boston Massacre. And long story short, basically a few of the Sons of Liberty antagonized the British by throwing rocks and snowballs and all of that. And they were telling them to fire and they shot uh, five people. In the crowd now this isn't a massacre by our modern definition but it is a massacre at the time because one very very strict but untold rule is that war and civilians should be kept apart in a very strict and defined line and having soldiers fire upon people was at this time treated worse than a war crime it was treated as if God himself has struck down upon these people so uh, at this point, a radical known as Sam Adams, as well as another publicist known as Paul Revere, uh, this might sound familiar because of his Midnight Riot, turned this massacre into a very popular anti-British propaganda hit piece. And this is the product of that. You guys might have seen this painting of the British soldiers firing upon this 
uh, the civilians. The actual event was far more chaotic and it wasn't so lined up. This propaganda was extremely effective because many people felt that the British were no longer there to protect them, but to oppress them. Um, however, all the troops involved in the massacre were trialed in Massachusetts, and they were found not guilty thanks, thanks to one future president known as John Adams who was defending them. And he ensured that it was a fair trial. He even got them off the murder charges because he, he basically proved to the court that the civilians were the ones antagonizing the troops. They were throwing stuff and hurting the soldiers. Um, however, this is, again, this is the reason why people are pissed at the Administration of Justice Act. This happened before the passing of the Intolerable Acts. Because remember, the, uh, the colonists gave the British a fair trial, especially after murdering several of their own. And yet the British distrust them. They would prefer to have British citizens and colonists move to England or some other colonial state to have their trial and make it impossible for any colon colonists to testify for them. This effectively allows them to kind of skip justice as a whole. And, and furthermore, at this point, like I said, Ben Franklin was perhaps the father of creating this idea of a colonial union between the 13 states. His, uh, well, his, his art known as the Join or Die piece, again, very famous, and during the revolution, it would symbolize the needed bonds uh, and survivability one every state had upon the other. He, he created this idea of a colonial union whereby all 13 states, uh, all 13 colonies, formed together to rally against uh, potential enemies, including, if necessary, the British. This was not taken very seriously. This was usually treated as the punchline to a joke uh, in dinner conversations because of how disunited the states are, again, because of lack of transportation, lack of communication, and this is something you will see throughout uh, US history, is uh, a lack of communication infrastructure and uh, basically interactions between people from different states results in a, break a breaking of relations between people from the states. Um, and it basically caused a disunited states. And also the proclamation of 1763 really pushed people to really consider on why they stuck with the British. Many of these states, Virginia, North Carolina, South Carolina, they wanted to expand beyond the Appalachian Mountains because they're, they're being squeezed in. There's a lot more people entering these states and being born into it, but they're running out of territory and land to give. And many of them felt that the proclamation of 1763 was a massive stab in the back for them. And to, to summarize kind of Franklin's idea, it's the whole cliche, united we stand, divided we fall. He was the first major nationalist, well not the first, but he was the most prominent early nationalist and promoter for a nationalistic idea. So up until now, uh, basically the colonial states just kind of wanted more autonomy. They wanted to restore uh, things before salit uh, back to uh, salutary neglect uh, when they still had autonomy over their policies. Um, so they basically thought the upper class citizens of every state got together to discuss how to uh, deal with this violation of both both the violation of salutary neglect and the intolerable acts. Many of them wanted to restore the status quo antebellum, basically the state of matter before all of this chaos happened. Many of them were also afraid that if the British left and basically abandoned them, the colony would collapse. And again, they're rich, they're wealthy, many of them are very conservative by ideals because they stand to lose profits if the British uh, cuts trade. And also, at this point, remember, the British is primarily responsible for manufactured goods. Most of the artisans, people who make a living making goods, live in England because that's that's generally a better they better they usually have a better quality of life so because of the fact that they met, uh, manufacture goods um, so the colonists the first continent the colonists formed the first continental congress and they moved to petition the king known as the olive branch petition 
And it's called the Olive Branch Petition because the Olive Branch is the symbol of peace. And that's exactly what they wanted. They wanted to restore peace and stability back into the colonial states, back to these uh, kind of these rebellious people because they wanted the state to do well. They wanted the colonies to do well. And in the petition, they basically argued that the only way to calm down the states without going to war is to lower taxes and to pull back some of these uh, dangerously unconstitutional, well, dangerously uh, tyrannical laws. Um, they also mentioned very subtly to not hang them because by forming this Continental Congress, they're denying kind of, you know, again, town meetings are illegal. This, by definition, is a town meeting. They're asking not to hang them and also to give basically colonists their rights back. Now, uh, as all good fairy tales go, uh, the king basically, before even reading this petition, declared that anyone who is rebelling at this point should be uh, punished by loyalists or by government officials, including soldiers, or hung. Because the rebels are, quote unquote, trying to create their own empire. Uh, and this, this was a massive, I, I, I know I've said this a few times, but this is perhaps the, uh, the, the flint, the spark that really blew up everything. It, this effectively swung many common citizens because at this point, his, his definition of who a rebel is, people who are just expressing their discontent. Those are considered rebels. Those are considered seditious acts. And they could be hung for that. It changed the sentiments of basically regular common folks. People who weren't even that informed. People who loved the king. But now realize that the king might not be necessarily the best choice. It changed the sentiments of the average American. Of the average colonist. And two pieces of documents best document this. First off, it's Thomas Paine's Common Sense. This was an art, uh, literature hit piece by Payne, who was, before the revolution, a shoe shiner, as well as a dressmaker. He basically worked with textiles and clothes. And then he came to America and wrote a very uh, significant, seminal uh, literature that argued for independence. So he, he believes that the 13 colonies need to be independent of British rule at any cost, because the British have violated their social contract and they treat colonial citizens as second-class citizens. And Payne was correct because colonists at these times, at this time, could not uh, be promoted beyond uh, being a colonel and they had less rights than, say, someone who was born in the British Isles, who was born on the island of Britain. Uh, and another document that really shows the transition of opinions and how they, they changed is the Adams Lenders, which is a correspondence between John and Abigail a Adams, basically future uh, president and first lady of the United States. He will be the second president, and that will be talked about more tomorrow. Uh, well, it will be talked about later. Um, it basically shows the beliefs transitions. So uh, most of the letters themselves are very flirty and humorous. Um, so I'm not going to kind of read them. It's also hard to read them because it's written in Old English. Um, but from 1762 to 1774, generally the attitude Americans held against British were basically accepting. They were not satisfied, but they were not angry to the point where they wanted to uh, hold up in arms. They were, however, more and more worried about the new policies as well as how the imperial authorities were kind of behaving. And that is in reference to, again, all of the acts and the responses that the uh, British monarchy have done up to now. And from 1774 up until 79, they transitioned from an on-the-fence kind of stance to an increasingly belle belligerent to almost hostile uh, towards the British and up until 1776 they were hostile and these two events ultimately led to uh, the first battle of the American Revolution 
and that's the Lexington and Con Battle of Lexington and Concord. Uh, a formation of Minutemen and militias. Minutemen are more well-trained uh, soldiers who would, could assemble in a minute. That's why they're called the Minutemen. As well as militias. Uh, basically, every city had both of both of which. Um, and in the city of Lexington, as well as Concord, they were storing large amounts of munitions. Now, the British in Boston, th these two places are close to Boston, um, found out that they were storing munitions, so they sent a larger dispatch of troops to go seize weaponry, only to discover that the weaponry was moved. And that was because of one uh, Paul Revere and his Midnight Riot. Um, ultimately, as the British were returning back to Boston, the militiamen as well as the Minutemen ambushed the British, and no, this was known as the first shot heard around the world. This being the first shot of freedom in America's independence, some people will call it that. This effectively led to the Second Continental Congress, and this differs from the first in that the First Continental Congress was really going for a, an appeasement type, trying to appease the king. While the Second Continental Congress was going for more of a uh, we've had it attitude. And the Second Continental Congress, through the extent of a year, drafted and declared the Declaration of Independence. This is a fundamentally in important document. I, this is very self-explanatory on why it's very important. But in case it's not really, in case it, you, know, you don't understand why it's so important, it's because it sets the precedent for the Constitution and basically most American behavior up until, well, even now. It is very, very influential in American society. Uh, and the first part of it, uh, the structure of the Declaration goes by this. The first part is more philosophical. It argues for the legal and philosophical justifications of what a social contract is. What is the contract between... British citizens, as well as uh, the British colonial go uh, British government, they argue that they people are equal regardless of whether they're a colonist or if they're a citizen. Uh, as in the line, all men are created equal. Um, and then the second part of the Declaration talks effectively about the grievances, which consist of acts, policies, as well as behaviors of the. British government, by the way, HM, HM government uh, stands for uh, His Majesty's government, which represents the British monarchy, and it goes into how the acts, policies, and behaviors of the royal government are effectively uh, tyrannical. Um, and so there's another part, which the final part talks more about what is the new government they want to form. So basically the basic principles of forming this new government and how it would differ from this old tyrannical oppressive behavior of the, of the British government. Um, usually I will cover more on the battles, but because today there's a lot more content on the post-war government, these are the three more significant battles. They're quite, I'm going to summarize them. Uh, the Battle of Bunker Hill is uh, one of the earliest battles. It was a battle that was close to Boston. It can some consider it the Battle of Boston itself? Um, basically, a British, large amount of British regiments uh, charged up a hill against a small American force, and the Americans won a terrific victory. And th this is essentially this that set the trend and precedent for essentially all battles of within the revolution as well as the revolution itself which is americans taking heavy casualties but inflicting so much more casualties on the british that the british are forced to retreat this is a pattern that will occur throughout the american revolution and of the revolution itself the battle of saratoga was the first major american victory that wasn't just uh, an ambush or a small skirmish it was the battle that also determined French entrance into the war in support of uh, America, uh, particularly in providing uh, ammunition, ships, and all the necessary supplies. Next to that, we have the Battle of Yorktown, which is the final battle, the nail in the coffin of the American Revolution. The siege and subsequent capture of Yorktown, Virginia, made such a humiliating defeat to the 
British public eye that most British citizens started recalling their uh, members of parliament just to tell them that it, it, it's not worth the war. Uh, and at this point, it was costing more to fight the Americans than it was to try and get them get the Americans to pay up. Basically, the amount of money they were getting from the colony was so insignificant in comparison to how much money they're losing just fighting these colonists. And this is something that America's enemies will learn to utilize as a tactic later on. The end of the American Revolution saw the Treaty of Paris in 1783. The conditions of the peace uh, goes by, basically these are terms that are uh, negotiated. The Americans uh, receive independence, but the British get to keep Canada, including the city of Quebec uh, and the city of Montreal that the Americans initially captured and then lost. The Americans received the Ohio ri River Valley, and this is very important. This is very, very important. The Ohio River Valley is the first massive expansion westward. Uh, I will talk more about the Northwest Ordinance later on, but the Ohio Ra River Valley is a very, very fertile land that will prosper America forward by at least half a decade. <clears throat> and on the other hand, the British negotiated for all American loyalists who basically helped the British throughout the war to keep their property. That means houses, farms are not to be seized, and those seized property should be given back to the loyalists. Uh, these are two terms, however, that these two terms, the British removal of forts, which the British promised to remove forts all over America or to hand them over to the Americans, that's a term that the British won't keep and would be a uh, catalyst for the War of 1812. And the British also made the Americans to try and promise to not expand beyond the Appalachian Mountain. Now, if you remember, you'll recall back to earlier on, 1763 was... The proclamation of 1763 also asked for the same thing here. Uh, so as you can tell, the Americans were not keen to follow the same proclamation. They expanded beyond the Appalachian Mountain, and that ultimately resulted in 18, the War of 1812 as well. Um, now we're going to cover the federalistic aspect. This is what happened. This is the basically the effects of the revolution. So after they've won the war, the Americans are wondering what should the post-war government be. They don't want a monarchy because the monarchy was tyrannical, oppressive, and enacted a series of acts that they had no voice in. Um, so they went back to the Magna Carta, which is the original founding document for English, which is like an English Bill of Rights. Not the English Bill of Rights, but a Bill of Rights. It basically imposed check and balances against an executive, and the executive being the king, uh, by the nobles, which at that time was the legislative body, and it established some kind of undeniable rights, known as the unalienable rights, to uh, English citizens. Uh, these include a trial by jury, uh, no torture, and that kind of stuff. This was pu uh, this was initially published in 1215. So the American colonists got together and they created the Articles of Confederation. Now this document is seminal in later on, but particularly this document was a formation and a compromise between states in uh, creating a colonial union, but still allowing each state to keep its autonomy. This is paradoxical and quite impossible to achieve. There is no physical way you could keep your autonomy while creating a union. So even though de jure, and de jure means that by law, uh, it should be a binding of 13 states to have equal voice and representation. Uh, de facto, which means the fact of the matter is, it, it was a dysfunctional Congress and that had little to no oversight over any of the states. It was anarchical at best. That's why it was called the Articles of Friendship, because Congress couldn't raise an army, it couldn't raise taxes, it couldn't handle trade disputes, it couldn't settle what trades is allowed to do, it couldn't pay debts, and it was it was essentially useless. It was a it was a token organization, and it needed unanimous agreement to pass any legislation, which means that no legislation was ever passed. So a constitutional convention was called in 1787, 
this initial con convention was created to reform and kind of amend the Articles of Confederation. But a small group of radicals that increasingly became larger, known as the Federalists, noted here, these are notes of uh, basically organizations at this time you should know, the Federalists, uh, led by Alexander Hamilton, James Madison, as well as others, they wanted to scrap the Articles of Confederation altogether to create a new constitution. And they argued this in the Federalist Papers, which was a series of essays by John J. Ale uh, Hamilton and Madison on the necessity of the Constitution and what it should include that would make the AOC basically redundant. Um, and many people were many people were initially uh, skeptical of this, but then during the convention, a rebellion known as Shays Rebellion occurred. Now, basically, because of the revolution and how expensive it was, it made it impossible for farmers to repay their debts because the banks wouldn't lend them any more money. So they foreclosed their banks, and many soldiers were not getting paid. They were paid in bonds, and Hamilton would later fix that. But for now, they were, they were poor. They fought in the war. They didn't get any money. So one Captain Daniel Shea, who also fought in the American Revolution and was a drunkard, he and a bunch of boys got together with uh, some now homeless farmers, combined force to create an armed uprising, which forced the state of Massachusetts, which was where this was all taking place in, to basically like mobilize its entire reserves to fight them. And it wasn't enough. Uh, it got so bad that uh, at this point, the con Congress had to authorize pay to pay mercenaries or retirees to help put the rebellion down, and states did unanimously agree to that. And, you know, people did not want a repeat of this happening. And this was a result of the AOC being incompetent. However, there was different interpretation of how the Constitution should be created. Um, one big states like the Virginian Plan, which saw a supreme national government, bicameral, which means two chambers of legislation, and proportional representation. And Hamilton was a bit radical in that he, was, he wanted to have an executive who served for life who was elected um, but people thought of him as a monarchist because monarchy works like that uh, and part of the uh, agreement was the three-fifths clause as well this gives slave states a lot more power three-fifths clause is a clause that basically states that slaves are three-fifths of a person so two slaves would count as one person Basically, in, in counting proportional representation, three-fifths clause increases the population of slave states significantly. However, small states like New Jersey were worried that their voice could be erased very easily by big states. And they were right. They, they, they are right in worrying. So instead, New Jersey wanted a unicameral equal representative Congress. So basically like the Articles of Confederation, uh, the Congress in the Articles of Confederation, as well as uh, one that can apply taxes, tariffs, have a judicial branch, an executive branch that is one term, and congressional supremacy. Basically, a reformed Articles of Confederation. That was what they were going for. However, in order to appease both sides because of what that's what a republic is, uh, a compromise known as the Connecticut Compromise occurred. So that was basically the modern constitution. So basically it led to the three branches. The legislative branch is responsible for creating laws and uh, deciding their funding. The executive is responsible for executing the laws and the judiciary is responsible for deciding if laws are constitutional. Now before Marbury versus Madison, which I will talk about in a while, uh, judiciary branch was rather useless. In fact, John Jay, this, this man over here, who was the first chief justice called the judiciary branch a useless branch of the tree. However, Marbury versus Madison, which would occur after the election of 1800s, basically had John Marshall, who was the fourth chief justice, uh, deciding, uh, creating a concept known as judicial review, which Michael will talk about more tomorrow. Um, and so there was essentially the result of which was the belief that rights had to be listed as well so basically this led to the creation of the bill of rights which are the first 10 amendments to the constitution that specifically listed out what rights are protected this is to ensure uh, a repeat this is to prevent a repeat of what the british did 
because there was no direct mention of what rights are protected and what rights are neglected in the English Constitution. It's not written. The English Constitution is not one binding document. It's a compilation of hundreds of thousands of essays. It, it's very messy. I'm not going to read out the rights, but you can tell it's basically ones that are uh, pointing out to the grievances. Now, after the Bill of Rights, and generally the Constitution, uh, this led to the first party system. This was the first big disagreement and where the bipartisanship began. Yes, the bipartisanship didn't begin in the 1800s. It started right after America became independent. The two parties that were uh, bickering was the Federalists versus the Democratic Republicans. The Federalists were basically the Federalists uh, mentioned before. They wanted strong centralized government and strong centralized economic plans as well as a strong executive. And they consist of Hamilton, Adams, and Chief Justice Marshall. On the other hand, you have Democratic Republicans who didn't, they're not like anti-federalists in that they do support the Constitution, but they hate centralized government. They believe in what Jefferson calls the diffusion of power. They wanted power to not be centralized so that it can't be uh, uh, used to, they can't be abused. And the main leaders of those is Jefferson, Madison, and Burr. And Madison was a Federalist, but the return of Jefferson from his post in France kind of made, made him realize that maybe the big states are trying to take advantage of the situation. So the first party system was basically a series of political battles, the first of which was over the U.S. economy. Now, this is very long, so I'm going to summarize this. The Federalists basically believe in what is known as Hamiltonian banking, uh, which is more popularly known as the National Bank Plan. They wanted to create a centralized national bank to issue a national U.S. currency and replace all state currencies with a national U.S. currency to pay war and public debts as well as private debts. Uh, and also it would sell bonds to wealthy speculators to create safe and slow returns to control the currency flow. These are very complicated current uh, economic ideas, but basically he wanted to stabilize the U.S. economy by creating a centralized economic force. The Democratic Republicans, however, despised this. They wanted to keep the status quo, the current state. They wanted to continue having state banks issue the uh, state currencies, which are basically giving states more power in their economies, uh, that ultimately still continued basing against hard cu currency as well as other state currency. And they hated how Hamilton wanted to uh, have this kind of federalistic view on paying off debt. The argument was that Virginia shouldn't have to fill the shoes of New York just because New York, uh, New York, if New York has debt that Virginia has to kind of weigh in on it, he was very much against that. Um, and ultimate, ultimately, he hated the banking system, Hamiltonian banking, because he believes it would centralize wealth and prosperity in the North, particularly those in Wall Street who will benefit most from the safe and slow returns of bonds and not the poorer farmers and common citizens who can't afford those bonds or could only afford smaller amounts of those bonds. Ultimately, George Washington sided with the Federalists, creating the first national bank and chartering that for 20 years. The bank, however, was privately owned. The government only held one-fifth, basically the government only held one-fifth of a uh, share in control of the U.S. bank. Uh, in terms of foreign affairs, which is the second battle, the Federalists were very much against uh, were more pro-British, which made them look like traitors because a lot of them were, again, wealthy merchants and bankers who, ha who are still close with many British uh, tradesmen and all that. The Democratic Republicans supported Jefferson's idea of a post-revolutionary France. They see it as like, like a brother of sorts. France at this time was uh, before Napoleon but after revolution. So it was anarchical, which is also why they were afraid, because they, they thought that the French were too anarchist. Um, and they also believed that America was repaid the debts to France uh, that it occurred during its revolution. Without the funds from France, the Americans could not have won the American Revolution. So Jefferson believes that America should go to war with Britain to help pay back its debt to France. The Federalists basically said that's not going to happen because the debt is owed to a previous regime. Uh, also, most Democratic Republicans are kind of like lower class, so they relate to uh, the French peasantry who created the revolution. Ultimately, Washington again sided with the Federalists. They issued a neutrality statement, 
and a neutrality statement effectively meant that the British, the Americans were against France. And this picture depicts the Quasi War, which was an undeclared but very deadly war between France and America. It defaults its war debts, and it basically established the first trade agreement, known as the Jays Treaty, which basically created trade relations between France, uh, between Britain and America for 10 years. Uh, now into the expansion of the West. Basically, the Whiskey Rebellion was this small uprising created mostly by Democratic Repel Republicans who were very much upset on the 50% tax on, the, on whiskey. It's called the Whiskey Tax. And they basically believe it's like a reincarnation, like a reenactment of the Townshend Acts, which Americans revolted against. And Washington and a few of his generals led the uh, Continental Army, which is now a thing because of um, the Constitution, to put down the uprising. And it established this uh, supremacy, this precedence that federal power is over that of common citizens. And then there was a Northwest Ordinance. This is slightly insignificant. You don't really have to remember this. It's good if you write it down anyway. It basically established a method for distributing land and it set down this concept that states will no longer be allowed to expand their land. Rather, uh, new states will be created in the Western territories. And it temporarily set slavery to be prohibited beyond the Ohio River. And up until the end, so Washington led his farewell address that basically states that a two-party system is dangerous and it sets a precedence that Americans will be bitted against each other. And he was right. Uh, right after this, the Federalist and Democratic Party went against one Democratic, Democratic Republican Party, kind of went head to head against each other. And he believed that this partisanship will paralyze the government and then the nation. And he was right. In 1798, Adams became president. When Adams was president, he issued the Aliens and Sedition Act. The Aliens part basically makes naturalization and citizenship very difficult to attain. He set the standards high so that only the wealthy could achieve it because, um, and he also allowed it non-citizens to be deported without clause because a lot of these poorer citizens were naturally Democratic Republicans uh, because the party, offer, party offered them substantially more uh, benefits. And the seditions part is very unconstitutional. It basically criminalized making any false statement against the federal government and it was used primarily to prosecute uh, the press owners of pro-Jefferson, uh, pro Democratic Republican newspapers. So in response, the Democratic Republicans published the Virginia and Kentucky resolutions, which basically their idea is that states have the right to nullify any federal law it believes is unconstitutional. This I would write down in your notes uh, because it will be brought up again. Nullification also basically allows the state governments to bypass any the supremacy clause in the Constitution. And it believes that the Alien Seditions Act is a violation of the First Amendment. And this, in fact, would ultimately be the result of the Democratic-Republican victory of 1800s, which Michael will talk about more tomorrow. And that is basically the revolutionary era. Um, I hope that was clear. If there's any part that is not clear, feel free to ask questions on our Discord. Um, this video will be available up until... Uh, AP exams end. You can come back anytime to review. If you have any questions, again, ask on Discord. Uh, and please donate to our donation campaign. All the funds, 100% of it, will be going to the Gates Foundation. And we're hoping that you would help us to fight against Corona and its impacts. Uh, and yeah, um, I think I, I think I can. There's time for questions. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah. If you have any questions, just ask on the Discord. Uh, check the description, the video description for our Discord donation and our website link. Check our website to look at other contents we have to offer. And remember to tune back in if you have any questions or troubles with period four, five, six, or seven. We will be covering those as well. Uh, it is now. Uh, yeah. All right, thank you very much.